my lovely wife and assistant Rebecca's passing those out. Um, well, as you know, just like, he, just like he said, I think geographically we're the closest Grace Church to the conference. We're probably maybe 10 miles up the road. Um, Little, little country church, Fox River Bible Church, um, and which was formerly a Baptist church. We're a Grace Church now. Um, that, that song, Dwelling in Beulah Land, we did sing that song. We still sing that song, only we, just like we do here, we don't sing Beulah Land anymore. Um, but that is a great song. Um, so we are talking about, as he said, um, Daniel's Remarkable Prophecy is the, the title of the topic. Now, um, for what it's worth, Daniel actually has, needless to say, several remarkable prophecies um, in the book of Daniel. But specifically, we're talking about a prophecy that happens in Daniel chapter 9. And really what this is, it has to do with, again, the 70 weeks of Daniel. And we've, most of us are either at least familiar with that term. Um, some are going to, again, know a little bit more about that than others. But if something is dispensationalist, we need to at least know what the 70 weeks of Daniel are. Um, so when we hear that term, and how dispensationalism locks into this, and, and where this fits in the puzzle, and how that's really, again, kind of an important issue. Um, it is, as they say, tough terrain in Bible study. When you get online and you start Googling stuff about um, the 70 weeks of Daniel, you're going to find as many different interpretations as you're going to find websites out there. There's just so much information and different opinions. And when you, and you know, we're going to say this, but when you do study the Bible dispensationally, the Bible can make sense. It is the key to understanding the scriptures. Um, and it's going to help us lock things into place, again, where the scriptures can make sense. We don't have to spiritualize things. We don't have to make things up that aren't there. We can just let the words on the page be the words on the page. And that's, again, um, going to be a really um, a big difference. It's called the dismal swamp of prophecy because, again, there's so much um, disagreement. Daniel talks about, he says, unto us are given confusion of faces. And that's really what prophecy does. There's a confusion of faces. And when we start to understand some things dispensationally, um, the confusion starts to um, go away. And the key, as um, we read in 2 Timothy 2.15, is to study. Um, and this is really a great opportunity, again, to, to do that. Now, um, first thing I want to really kind of start right out of the gate with is this, is the God of the Bible is interested in numbers. He's interested in numbers. Um, Here's my first clue, the, the, the fourth book of the Bible. What's the name of the book? Numbers. Numbers. Okay, well, that's a, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good clue right out of the gate. Um, right, out, right out of the gate, again, when God starts his book, he's ta he talks about the first day, the second day, the third day. He talks about numbers. In the book of Matthew, Christ says, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So when we look around the room, he's, some, some heads have more numbers than others, some are de decreasing, um, decreasing numbers. If you like math, and this is really something that actually did it for me when I started looking into um, the Bible. I'm a publisher, so I'm interested in books. And one of the things that I noticed right away is, is if you like math, the Bible uses a lot of math terms. It talks about accounting and reckoning. Um, it talks about those kinds of things. It talks about adding. It talks about removing. It talks about multiplying. It talks about dividing, right? Um, we've heard of right division. Have, have you ever heard of left division? Left division is when somebody used to rightly divide and then they left. <laughs> that's, that's, thankfully, that doesn't happen very often. But the Bible, again, is really going to meet you wherever you live. If you're into gardening, if you're into farming, it talks about planting. It talks about watering. It talks about husbandry, digging. Um, seeds, light. Um, if you like building, it talks about foundations, it talks about cornerstones, it talks about windows and doors and towers. If you like sports, it talks about running, it talks about fighting, it talks about leaping, and all these different things. And just from a literary standpoint, I looked at this book and I realized God wrote this book. Because he can meet you wherever you live intellectually. He, he can, in other words, he can communicate to you on your terms, on things that you understand um, artistic terms, all kinds of different terms, but he can meet you again scripturally where um, you live. Man did not come up with that. No, no man had the wisdom to put all that stuff in the scripture. Another thing that did it for me is the fulfillment of prophecy. So one of the things again that I personally became persuaded with 
um, is the Bible's track record of fulfilling prophecy literally. So when you look at all those things combined and you realize that I'm dealing with God's book, then it's going to change um, dramatically some of um, our opinions on the thing. And um, God is also interested in time. Speaking of time, I'll start the timer. Um, God's interested in time, right? Right Again, right out of the book of, of Genesis, he talks about different things. Time, he talks about the first day. He talks about weeks, months, years, ages, things like that. Um, and that's what we're talking about this morning is we're talking about numbers, we're talking about time, and we're talking about prophecy. So the number that we're looking at is 70. The, the time period that we're looking at is weeks. The prophet that we're looking at is Daniel. So we're talking about the 70 weeks of Daniel and just how all of this stuff lines up. We're talk, Again, the subject is Daniel's remarkable prophecy. When something is remarkable, that means it is worthy of attention. It's striking. It, 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 again, it commands your attention. The primary passage that we're going to really look at, and we're not going to start here right away, but is Daniel chapter 9. Now, before I went to or went through grade school, the Bible, I'll, I'll say this. You know, I had gone through 12 years of um, Catholic education. I didn't know anything about the book of Daniel. I mean, when I say I didn't know anything about the book of Daniel, I mean I went, I knew nothing about the book of Daniel. I think, how does somebody go through 12 years of classes where they don't mention? Well, they don't talk about it because they don't know anything about it. Um, we should know something about that. Now, my point isn't to bash any denomination, any religion. That's not, that's not my point. But what I'm saying is this. These are things that are important for us to know something about. Um, and certainly as believers, these are things um, that we want to understand some, some basic things about that. Now, um, one of the foundational things that we want to talk about, let's go to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25. Um, the nation of Israel, we understand here again that there is a difference between Israel and the church, the body of Christ. Um, if you don't understand that there's a difference between those two, then, then stick around a little bit this week. And hopefully um, you'll be fully persuaded that there is a difference between Israel and um, the body of Christ. If you don't take a dispensational standpoint, by the way, of studying scripture, you're going to just utterly make mincemeat out of things. You cannot reconcile something like Daniel chapter 9 if you don't take a dispensational standpoint. You cannot do it. It's not, it's not an issue of debate. You cannot do it. You can't reconcile it without spiritualizing something and making something up and making verses say something that they don't say, again, without taking a dispensational standpoint. Well, the nation of Israel, when we get into the book of Leviticus, they're under a contract. And really what it is is it's a legally binding contract that they've just signed. Um, there's, we've said this before. There's only two names on the contract. Jehovah's name is on the contract. Israel's name is on the contract. There's no third party. There's, there's, there's only one nation that has that name on the, that contract, that signed that contract. That is the nation of Israel. Um, when we get into the book of Leviticus, what it's really talking about, it's gone through this big series of laws. So we've just gone through Exodus, we've just gone through the information in Leviticus, and now what we're doing is we're getting into the fine print of the contract. These are the, the terms. In other words, if you don't pay us the mortgage, we're taking the house back. If you don't pay for the car payment, we're coming and repoing your car. We're, we're gonna, you're, there's going to be consequences for this. The, well, the law has that. We have a country that, again, we live in. If you, if you break the law, there are consequences for those laws, and they're, they're put in writing. Well, God does that. And when we're in Leviticus, we're really reading about the contract, again, and some of the details of this. Now, there's, there's really kind of an interesting law that, that God gives, and again, there's, there's a, a series of laws, needless to say, but one of the things that he gives is kind of an interesting law, is he says, you're going to live on this land, and there's going to be a Sabbath for the land itself. So not only are you going to observe a Sabbath, so you're going to have a weekly Sabbath that you're going to observe. By the way, if you pick up a stick, we kill you. Um, any questions? That's the law. Um, very clear, black and white. No, no gray area there. Well, the, well, he also has a Sabbath for the law, or a Sabbath for the land. He says you're going to work the land for six years, and then on the seventh year you're going to let the land rest. You're going to you're going to give the land a rest, and um, that is again part of the law. Leviticus chapter 25. The Lord spake to Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, "Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years shall thou sow." thy field, in six years shall thou prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year 
shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. And again, that's the whole point that we want to make at this point. Well, they're supposed to give, again, let's go over to Leviticus chapter 26. They're supposed to give the law, or they're supposed to give the land a rest, a Sabbath. And at the end of the day, um, they don't do that. So there are some things that are going to add up. So just like in this country, we have laws. And what sometimes you'll hear about somebody, I, I see some individuals that are in the legal system, um, and they'll tell you, they'll talk about a repeat offender. So a repeat offender comes up to a judge, well, you know, the first time we're going to give you this, the second time it's going gonna, it's gonna to get intensified a little bit. Now, if you keep repeating this, um, I'm going to throw the book at you. And God essentially does that. So, but again, he's put this in writing so they understand the terms of this and, and some of the consequences that are going to go along with this. Well, Israel end up, ends up becoming, again, a repeat offender. Leviticus chapter 26, we'll read in verse 34. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lie desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. Now let's um, skip down to verse 43. The land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbath while she lie desolate without them and they shall accept the punishment of their iniquity because even because they despise my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. So basically what God is saying at this point, um, if you don't give the land a Sabbath, I'm going to get you off of the land and then the land's going to get rest without you on it. So there, there's no option at this point. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just remove you from the land, and if that's what I have to do to give the land a rest, then that's what we're going to do. And I have that built right into the law. So again, they can, they can understand this, and it's very clear to them. So let's go to the book of 2 Chronicles, and we're going to go to the tail end of 2 Chronicles. The tail end of 2 Chronicles. Now, of course, we're um, much down the road. And like we said, they, they end up becoming a repeat offender. And this is just one of the things that they don't do. God's, God's biggest thing, by the way, is idolatry. Don't you dare worship another god. Don't you do that. Well, that's something they're going to they're gonna repetitively do. And that's really the, the ultimate um, consequences that they're going to have for this. Now, when we're at the tail end again of 2 Chronicles, we'll read 2 Chronicles chapter 36. We'll, be, we'll begin in, in verse 14. More, moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hollowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God, their fathers, sent it to them by his messengers rising up at times and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. He's a forgiving God. He's got compassion on them. But they mocked the messengers. This is the prophecy. We're, we're studying prophecy this week. And again, that's their attitude towards the prophets. Um, they don't do anything different today, right? They mock them. They, they laugh. It's silly to them. Um, they, they don't take it with any kind of, kind of seriousness. Until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people. Here it is. Till there was no remedy. You go into the doctors, well, what's the, what's, the, what's the cure? There is no cure. We're, we're done. <laughs> there, there, is, there is no remedy. The forgiveness is done. We, we've gone through the forgiveness. Um, you've repeated this over and over and over till there is no, more, there is no remedy. You, you're going into captivity. That's, there's not a question of whether or not you're going into captivity. You are going into captivity. The only thing that you can do is offer yourself up so that you don't get slaughtered but you're going into captivity because there is no remedy at this point. And then what happens is really the nation, when we're talking about this from a historical standpoint, needless to say, the nation has been split into two nations. So you have the northern kingdom, which is the ten tribes up north, and then you've got the southern kingdom, Judah, which is the two tribes. Now, they're representatives of all the nations down in Judah, but Judah is really the one at this point that we're reading about that goes into captivity in Babylon. God is the one that strengthens Nebuchadnezzar. He says, you're my servant. I'm going to strengthen you. Now I want you to get him out of my land. So Neb, Neb says, you're coming with me. And God is the one that is the one that is behind this. And he takes his nation um, into captivity in Babylon. So when we're looking at all of this, 
One of the things, again, we said that God is interested in math. He's interested in numbers. Well, there's a period of time that they're not observing these Sabbaths. And the period of time that they're not observing these Sabbaths is, is really a period when the kings take over. So when, once you start having the kings taking over, they're, they're really the ones that are going to be the culprits of this. And there's a period of 490 years where they don't do that. He says, okay, well, I can pull out my calculator. 490 years, you didn't give the Sabbath. So you were supposed to do one every seven years. So I divide 490 by seven, and I come up with 70. You're going into captivity for, for 70 years. Um, and then you can think about the land, and you can think about my laws when you're in captivity. And, and you can meditate on some of these things. So if you wonder why you're in captivity, you can just read about this so you don't have to be clueless as to what's going on. Um, Jerusalem is left desolate. People use the term the desolation of Jerusalem. When something is desolate, it is deserted of people. It's in a state of bleak and dismal emptiness. Desolation is a state of complete emptiness or destruction. Now you think about it, it's really not that long before where Solomon has a kingdom and the queen can come up and look at the kingdom and say, this is mind-blowing how powerful this kingdom is. I heard about this kingdom. I heard it was a good kingdom. I heard, I heard you had wealth. I heard you had military power. But nobody told me that it was like this. This is jaw-droppingly amazing. A few centuries later, now somebody can go into the land and go, where'd everybody go? What, what, what happened to the kingdom? You, 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 see, you see a ghost town. We're, I'm astonished now because there's nothing around. What happened to this, this nation Israel? What, what, what happened to them? Well, they're in captivity. That's what happened to them. And it's all because of a legal thing. Bab Babylon, again, is where they're taken into captivity. Now, in Daniel, let's go to the book of Jeremiah real quick. Jeremiah is essentially, uh, Jeremiah 25, he is essentially a contemporary of Daniel. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 25. Um, when Daniel is taken into captivity, he was really just a, a teenager, and he goes in, there's three waves that the captivity goes in over to Babylon. Daniel is taken in that first wave. He may have been from the royal family. Um, maybe he was given a, a place of privilege. And, and so now he's, he's, he's really being raised, again, in a place of um, privilege that we read about in the, in the book of Daniel. But he has access to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is not a very old book at this point, but Daniel obviously has access to it, so he has some kind of privilege, and he also has access to the law. So he has access to God's Word, and he can study these things, and he can learn from books the same way that you and I are here today, and we're learning from books about what's, go what's going on in the universe. Daniel has that um, privilege of doing that, and he is a Bible student, so he does just that. So I, I'm reading in Jeremiah chapter 25, and... We'll read down through. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. And the Lord had sent, has sent you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Turn ye again now, every one from his evil way, from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and your fathers forever. And go not after other gods to serve them and worship them, and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do no hurt. Ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, your conditional term, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because, another conditional term, ye have not heard my words. Behold, I'll, I'll send and take all the families of the north, said the, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against the land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual, here is the word, desolations. Um, moreover, I will take 
from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of uh, the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the, and the light of the candle and the, this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. Sev Here it is, 70 years. So Daniel goes, okay, now I got something. How long are we going to be in captivity? 70 years. Why? I just read it from a book. I, I just had access to Jeremiah. Jeremiah told me something. Now I know that I'm going to be in captivity for 70 years. So now I have something that I can, I can make some sense out of. So once, one more time, we, we just remembered that the, the, the nation had been guilty of not keeping those Sabbaths for 490 years, and we get 70 years. Now what's going to happen here is this. Daniel is actually going to be given another prophecy concerning a totally different 490 years. It's a, it's a completely different um, section, but yet the, the, the number is the same. It's still 490 years that, that Daniel is now going to be focused on. Now, as a sidebar, there are several periods of 490 years that God uses. God is interested in math. He's, he's, a, he's a God that's interested in numbers. He's interested in, in math. From the, call of Abra from the call of Abraham to the time that they enter the land, 490 years. From the judges to the last judge, or till Saul enters into the scene, 490 years. From the kings to the captivity, 490 years. The captivity itself, 70 years. The command to restore Jerusalem to the kingdom being established, 490 years. God wrote this book. Man didn't come up with that. God wrote that. So when we, under, when we understand the wisdom that's behind some of the things, no human brain came up with that. Um, that that's, that's something that, that God came up with. Um, Peter says to Christ, you know, if I forgive somebody, how many times should I forgive them? Seven times? Seven times 70. What's that? 490. <laughs> we, we lock all this stuff in together and we wonder why there's, um, there's um, th this pattern. Now God, just as a little sidebar, God is, one of his numbers is that, is that number seven. God counts in seven. That's his, that's his number. I think, again, something of, like music when you're listening to music, we listen to music on the radio, most songs are in four, or three, four. Okay, he counts in seven. Sunday, Monday, two, boom. Okay, and it starts again. Um, he can do different things, but that's never changed. He started counting in seven, and he's gonna continue counting in seven, and he does things in multiples of seven. You want, you want a punishment? Then I'm gonna use the number seven to give you that punishment. He, he uses these things, and we see, we see repetitive things that are going on and we just see how he, how he works on some of these things. Now, let's go to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. Now, this is all being said for this reason, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9 is going to use a term that's kind of a, not, I say, unusual term, but a little, a little unusual or a little different for our verbiage. Um, in, in the English language, we have words that I could, I could use. So if I, if I was referring to 12 of something, um, and I said, okay, I'm going to go get some donuts, I'm going to get a uh, dozen. Okay, I know what a dozen is, or I'm going to get a half a dozen. I know what a half a dozen is. Well, in the Hebrew, they have a term for that unit of seven. We don't have that wor word in English. So I don't, have a, I, don't have a, I don't have a phrase that can refer to a unit of seven. Well, in Hebrew, they do. And... So it's going to be something that they're, they're going to be familiar with. Well, the King James translators, what they did, correctly so, is they used the term weak. Now, it's also used in other places in, in Scripture, so it's not that they're grabbing at straws. Scripture uses that term weak. When you and I think of a week, we think of Sunday through Saturday, and that's what, that's what a week is. A week is seven to them. So I can have a week of days. I can have a week of weeks. A week of weeks would just be seven weeks. I could have a week of months. I could have a week of years, which would just be seven years. So scripture is going to use this kind of terminology in other places, so I just want to be familiar with it. So when I read about a week, it might be referring to a week of years or a week of months or something like that. And when we're reading about the 70 weeks of Daniel, we're not reading about 70 weeks Sunday through Saturday. 
or, or a certain period of time. What we're reading about is we're reading about 70 weeks of years. So that unit of seven years. Is, well, there's going to be 70 units like that. So I'm going to take seven years, and I'm going to do that 70 times. Well, if I have to repeat seven years, 70 times I come up with 490. So that's, that's, where, that's where that number is going to come um, together and it's going gonna, it's gonna to make some sense. So Daniel is now, he's given a prophecy concerning these things. And what, what the prophecy that Daniel is given is concerning the time frame of this kingdom being established, the time frame of Messiah coming on the scene and the kingdom being established. So it's, a, a, needless to say, a very profound prophecy. It's a remarkable prophecy, right? And so I can map that out and look at some of the timeline of this thing, and I can pull out a calculator, and when Messiah comes on the scene and John the Baptist is announcing him, I can say, you know, that matches up. The, the time is, is near. It's at hand. It's, 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 it, it, it's the appropriate time frame for this thing, and I can go back into a book and study that out, and it can make some sense to me, and I can line that... Um, Right up. So he's gonna he's gonna have really Daniel is gonna have this issue with the 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 time frame of Messiah's appearing again in the establishment of the kingdom. Very critical. Now there's a couple different aspects to this. So so I, I got a problem. I got a nation that's in captivity. They're a pathetic remnant of a nation. Uh, they're not living in their own land. They're living in somebody else's land, serving that nation. Well, the first thing I've got to do is I've got to get them back into my land. And then I've got to get this time clock, this stopwatch going. But the first thing I've got to do, well, I've got some good news for you, Daniel. Um, we're right at the end of the captivity. You're going to be going back into the land. It's some, good, some good things are going to happen. Um, the bad news is it's going to be another 490 years before you got the kingdom. And some things are going to have to happen during, during this time frame, some, some events are going to have to happen during this time frame. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, we're not going to really go through all of this, but Daniel is praying in Daniel chapter 9. Now, I want you to hold your place in Daniel chapter 9 because we don't want to miss this. And let's go all the way back to the book of Leviticus again and go to Leviticus chapter 26. Um, Leviticus chapter 26. People like to criticize the Bible, don't they? The, the higher critics, the intellectuals, they try, to, they try to come up with things and they say, well, yeah, that passage really shouldn't have been there or that was interpolated or that was added to the scriptures or it was a forgery, those kinds of things. They, they want to use human wisdom to try to attack the word of God. One of the things that's happening in Daniel chapter 9 is Daniel's praying. And what we read about here in Leviticus chapter 26, we just read about these horrible terms of this, this contract and then in verse 40, we read, If they shall confess their iniquity, and Daniel had this book. He could read Leviticus. And he read, If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that they have walked contrary unto me, and that I have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they accept the punishment of their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham. I will remember, and I will remember the land. Daniel knows how to do that. So he, he, he goes and he prays with a heart attitude. So we were talking about the, these critics and what they like to say. So somebody says, well, you know, the prayer in the, in the book of Daniel, that must have been added later because he gives them a prophecy. So he must have been praying for enlightenment. He must, have been, he must have been praying. It wouldn't have been a prayer of supplication. It would, have, it, would have been a, it would have been a prayer to give him some kind of prophetic vision. That's what the prayer would have been, not this, not this humble prayer, except we have Scripture that tells us that that's not the case. Daniel, Daniel has the book of Leviticus. He knows how to pray, and he, he knows what he's supposed to be doing. He's supposed to have a humble heart, and he really, what he at the end of the day, he says, God, don't do this for us. Do it for you. Defend your name. This is your kingdom. This is, this is, this is, this is something that, that you deserve. This is something that belongs to you. I like that prayer. Gabriel, go, go, go give him some prophecy. Do it now. Go, go quickly. While he's praying, God sends Gabriel down 
to give Daniel some information because Daniel had the right heart attitude in his prayer and he understood some things doctrinally and dispensationally as to what's going on. He understood why they were in captivity and what exactly was going on. So he's doing this in Daniel chapter 9. So we go back there and really the big, we're not going to, we're not going to read through all of that, but we just want to get that that's really the first half of the prayer. And then he gives this prophecy of these 70 weeks. And we want to look at, at what exactly what exactly is going on with this prophecy. As we just said before, God really interrupts his prayer, is what, what he ends up doing. And he gives them this, this prophecy in verse, in verse 20. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I came, and I come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. By the way, God gives light to people who have a right heart attitude, doesn't he? Isn't that interesting? You know, when, you, when your heart's in the right place, doesn't, isn't that what happens? God ends up giving you a little bit of light on something. It's just the pattern. It's just, it's just, it's just the way that it works. And, and, and you respond positively to that light, and he gives you a little bit more light. It's just the way that it works. And he's certainly doing this with Daniel, and he gives, them, he gives him this prophecy. Seventy weeks, verse 24, <laughs> Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So, so what exactly is going on? Why are, why are, why are these 490 years happen? Well, I got a reason. I got six reasons. And, he's, and he lays out what these six reasons are. And he says, this is, this is why this is happening. This is why, this is why we're, we're going to do this. And we're going we're gonna to just start with that. And then he says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So that's the, that's the, the first part. Verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Ton of information there. Ton, ton of information dispensationally. So this isn't just a little snippet of, of, of just when the Messiah is going to come on the scene. There is just, a, again, just a, a ton of information that's being revealed in, in this specific prophecy. Now, one more time, he gives really six reasons why this is going to happen. He says to finish the transgression, back to verse 24. He says to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That's why I'm doing it. He, 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 can, he can lay that out and he can understand that. Now, there's different ways that we could kind of divide that up and look at it. Now, the first three on that list concern Israel. The next three concern Messiah specifically. So when we're looking at those first three, to finish the transgression, um, they reject and crucify Messiah. To make an end of sins, to fill up the sins of the nation are going are gonna, to are gonna come to an end to make reconciliation for iniquity, to pay restitution. That has to do with, we're, and we're not going to get into all this, but that has to do with the Day of Atonement. There's a, there's, a, there's a restitution that goes on between God and the nation of Israel. And the next three concern Messiah, to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's the kingdom being established. To seal up the vision and the prophecy. To fulfill prophecy. There's no more need for prophecy at that point because the prophetic program has now 
done what it was set out to accomplish. It, it, it has now been, it's now been um, fulfilled. And, to, and here's really the, the, the largest of, the, of them, is to anoint the most holy. To get God's guy on the throne. That's the, that's the whole purpose of everything that we've been reading about from the book of Genesis. That, that's the whole purpose of everything, to establish this kingdom, that God is going to reign on planet Earth. He is going to establish a kingdom, and through that kingdom, he is now going to have his dominion over the planet, and he's going to do that through the nation of Israel. He has a guy that's going to sit on his throne. He has a guy in mind, and he says, when I, when I anoint this guy, now I've accomplished the purpose. That was really the, that was the end of the whole result of what all of this is, is ultimately, at the end of the day, um, working towards. So all of these things. Now, in the big picture, so there is, a, there is a little handout. And this is, now we've said this before, this is really true. Charts by themselves are kind of tough because it is hard, hard to draw any kind of perfect chart. But this gives at least a little bit of a, a graphic um, layout of what this thing is going to look like. So one more time, one week is going to end, is going to equate to seven years. Um, he says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that's what's going to start the time clock. So as, as soon as they're, they give, they're given the command, to, you, can, you can now get out of captivity and you can go and rebuild the city, boom, stopwatch is on. The time clock has now just started. Um, how long is this time clock going to go? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to go right up until, until the end of this thing, until the, until the thing is ultimately been accomplished. These 70 weeks, the terminology is if, as if the 70 weeks isn't odd enough for us, um, they're broken down into three groups or three sections. So it makes the terminology even more, again, kind of kind of head scratching as to what's going on with this. So he says, I've got, I got 70 weeks of years and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break them down mathematically the, the first week of, of again, that, w that we're going we're, we're gonna to look at this, or, the, or, or the, the first, I should say, the first seven weeks are now going to be a unit. And then there's going to be a unit of 62 weeks. So I start with seven weeks, and then I have add 62 weeks on top of that. Now I have 69 weeks. I got one week left. And then I got 70 weeks. So sometimes, when, not sometimes, but in Bible study, we'll refer to the 70 weeks of Daniel. That's referring to the whole thing. Sometimes we might just refer to the 70th week of Daniel. That's talking about that last week. Um, very similar terms, but we just want to understand the difference there. The 70th week is really just referring to that last week. The 70 weeks is, is dealing with this whole issue. So the first seven weeks, we'll read that through one more time. He says... Um, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So the first seven weeks, that equates to 49 years. So there's a period of 49 years where they're rebuilding the temple and they're rebuilding the city. Well, why does it take 49 years? Well, um, <laughs> Go, go on I-90, I how long does it take to build a... Um, anyway, that's a, that's a sidebar. We still take 49 years to build something, right? Um, well, they're going to run into some problems when, when they get there. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up taking them 49 years to, to ultimately get this thing together. And then there's going to be another 62 weeks. And then what happens is there's a, there's a phrase that's used that, that says after the 62 weeks... After three score and two weeks, verse 26, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of... Okay, so now, and then, there's a, and then there's a colon. So after the 62 weeks, I can figure that out on a calculator, Messiah is going to be cut off. So now I've just learned some things. That word after means something. So what that tells me is the Messiah is not going to be cut off during these 62 weeks. He's going to be cut off after these 62 weeks. And then God is going to accomplish some things. So I just want to line this up. And what this is going to do, the Bible frequently will do this, is it makes it even more confusing. So now, now instead of lining this up, and it's going to require that much more study and that much more, again, confusion that is going to come along with this. 
And what ends up happening is there ends up being a gap in time, or we say a delay. People talk about the delay principle, um, those kinds of things. David Reed is going to talk about the delay principle. I think maybe that's his topic. I would advise everybody to go to that. Um, and, and just th that, that idea, but the idea is this, is God reserves the right to delay things. He can do things on his time. He can, again, he can, he's the one that can do the time frame and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go work on something. Sometimes you might do that. Maybe you're out in the yard and you're working on something, and then you, you put it down, and then you go, you work on something else, and then you come back to working on what you were working on. A guy's working on something, and his wife is nagging him. He says, honey, I'm going to finish this thing. You don't need to tell me every year. <laughs> God, 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 is, God, is, God is finishing this thing, and he's doing it in his time. He can come back, and he can do this thing in his time frame. That's exactly what he does. So there's really what there is is to add to this confusion, there's a gap within this prophecy. Now, that gap has nothing to do with the age of grace. The age of grace is a mystery. The age of grace is a secret kept hidden in God. That gap would be there with or without the age of grace. So that's one thing that we want to, we're just looking at Israel's prophetic program. So we want to say, well, that gap must be the age of grace. That uh, gap is not the age of grace. There is a gap, and there are some things that are, have to happen during that gap. One of the things that has to happen is the Antichrist needs to actually start building up and coming onto the scene. So there's different things that are going to happen during this little gap period where, where Israel is really in the 70th week. And there's a, there's a time frame that has now kind of delayed the game, if you will. Now, we said this one time, is that God will sometimes do things where if you're not confused enough, then something else will get added to it, and which is okay because that, again, requires study. So I already have this gap, and now what he does is he takes something that is another gap, that is the age of grace, and says, okay, now I'm going to insert this gap inside the other gap. And now it's really going to delay some things. Well, we're here in 2018. So now it's just push back everything that much further. He says, you know, I'm going to work on this. I'm working on something. I'm not stopping what I'm working on. Covenant theology will tell you that. I stopped working on this, and I'm going to start working. I'm going to now make, make I'm going to change Israel into the body of Christ, and they're going to be one and the same. Uh, that's not what God said. God said, I'm working on Israel. I made some promises to Abraham. I made some promises to Isaac. I made some promises to Jacob. I'm going to keep good on my promises in my time. Hang on, I'm going to do something. I'm going to build something spectacular called the Church of the Body of Christ. I have a purpose for that thing. When that thing is fulfilled and I've done what I want to accomplish with the Church of the Body of Christ, I'm going to come back and we're going to get back to business with my nation so that I will have dominion on planet Earth, I will establish my kingdom, and I will reign over the Gentiles. That is going to happen. It's not a question. That will happen. But I'm going to do it in my time frame. So all of this stuff, what we just want to understand there, if nothing else, is just that that stuff is getting pushed back, if you will. There's a, there's, um, there, there's a, there's a pushing back of this, this prophecy. So now we just said, so we're right, we're right at that, that colon there. So we're back in, in reading in Daniel chapter 9. We read, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and then something, now we're all of a sudden in a time frame that is future tense and referring to some completely different things that are happening. And, and now all of a sudden we've, we've jumped ahead, well, at least a couple thousand years, um, conceivably further than that. And the people of the prince, now this prince that's being referred to is the Antichrist. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, a flood of attack, and unto the end the war desolations, and to the end of the war desolations are determined. So, so what's happening now? We're, we're reading about a time period that is this 70th week of Daniel. So some things are going to happen. Um, and the other places in Scripture are going to obviously line up with this. So some things are going to now start happening concerning the Antichrist and concerning the nation of Israel. He comes on the scene. Um, 
Israel is essentially going to be under attack. There's going to be, there's going to be other nations that are threatening them. And the Antichrist comes in, and what he does is, in, in, instead of just flexing his muscles, what he does is he's a salesman. And he flatters them. Come, come join me. We'll, 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 have a, we'll have a contract. Trust me. I'll protect you. Um, these other nations are going to attack you. Let me, let me be your protection. Um, sign the contract. Sign, sign, the, sign the covenant. And, of course, they end up doing just that. I'll rebuild the temple for you. I'll reinstitute animal sacrifices, because that's what you want, right? You want, you want the animal sacrifices. You want to worship God the way that your fathers did back in the Old Testament. I'm going to help you do that. Um, and we're going to reinstitute these animal sacrifices in the temple. In the middle of the week, so again, we're reading a seven-year period of time, broken up between three and a half years and then three and a half years. In the middle of the week, Antichrist is going to break this covenant. He's going to take those sacrifices out of the scene. And one of, we've said this before, and it's really true, one of the spookiest things in all of Scripture, Antichrist is actually going to die. Satan himself is, well, you know he wants to be like the Most High, right? That's his goal. So if, if, if God goes right, Satan wants to go right. If God has a priest, Satan wants to have a priest. If God says this, well, Satan wants to do this. He likes to be like the Most High. He wants to be worshipped like the Most High. That's, that's his M.O. So if God does something, I want to do something. So if God dies and he, he's raised from the ground, I want to die and be raised from the ground. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to be the Antichrist raised from the ground, resurrected, and so you know that Christ that they've been worshipping all along, he was a fraud. I'm the real deal. And then he's going to go into that temple, and he's going to have the audacity to sit down on the throne of God and command his worship. And Israel's going to do it. And we, and we see some of these things, and again, what we, what we see is um, some of these prophetic things, and just, again, just the, the horror that's associated with, with some of this activity, just the, the, just the, you know, we were trying to think of a word for it earlier, vile is the only word that I could think of, vile. Um, you know, you think about these, when, 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 the, when the temple had gotten ransacked before, one of the things that they did is they took these vessels out of the temple, um, something that's holy, how dare you go into the Holy of Holies? You touch that ark, you die. And then you got some Gentile pig king going in, ransacking these vessels, taking them into his palace, doing what he will with them. Um, abominable, abomination. Again, that goes along with just anything that's holy. And, and God is, and this is all stuff that has now taken place during the 70th week of Daniel. Things are going to heat up. So when we talked about this legal contract in the book of Leviticus, um, it's not light. It's not light. These aren't, these aren't slap on the wrist punishments. These are things that pile up and pile up and pile up and pile up. And what they do is they reflect the wrath of God and it reflects the holiness of God. And it reflects the seriousness of God. So when he says, I, I, want you to, I want you to go right, that's what he wants you to do. He, 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 he says it because when, when, when he tells us to do something, it's because he means it. Now, you and I are living in a very, needless to say, spectacular time period, a spectacular age. When I look at the big picture of scriptures, one of the things that I, I learn is that God has had this prophetic program all along. He's establishing this kingdom in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They have continued to reject this kingdom and say, we will not have this man to reign over us. Not today, we won't. Complete and utter rejection of Messiah. God says, I'm going to do something new. What I'm going to do is this, is I'm going to now create this body of Christ. I'm going to give eternal life to this Gentile as a free gift on a silver platter. No law. You can have it. Just take it. Just take it. I'm going to commission my man 
the Apostle Paul, and he's going to now reveal this information to planet Earth, that an individual, Jew or Gentile, is now saved by grace through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift of God. You and I are living in the most spectacular age in the history of planet Earth. Salvation could not be easier. There will be a time period when that offer is off the table. You and I are living during that time period where that offer is given to us freely. Now, if I understand that, I can look through some of these dispensational things, and I can look through some of these prophecies, and you know what happens? Is now I have a puzzle that starts to come together. If I try to wedge the age of grace into the prophetic program, like the 10,000 websites that you see out there on Google, do you see the confusion that I'm going to have? I will never, ever, ever understand my Bible if I do not understand the apostleship of Paul. Won't happen. I will not understand my Bible if I don't understand the Bible rightly divided and dispensationally. It is the key to understanding the scripture. It is not just some mantra that we say over and over and over. It is the key to understanding our scriptures. Just let the words say what the words say on the page. If we just let the words say what the words say, the Bible lines up. When we try to spiritualize these verses and we try to say things that they don't say, we're going to cut our neck over and over and over. And again, that's, that's, the, that's the nature of the confusion that goes on with this. Now, let's go back to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. We'll, we'll read verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. God's going to set up a kingdom. Other nations have kingdoms. He says, I'm going to have a kingdom. I'm going to establish the kingdom. The only difference is my kingdom, when I establish my kingdom, is not going to last for a few years. You have a president that goes on for four years, and then there's another one or king that dies. I'm going to establish a kingdom, and my kingdom is going to be an eternal kingdom. Um, my kingdom, by the way, is going to reign over your kingdoms, not the other way around. I'm going to establish a kingdom, and that kingdom is going to be a kingdom on planet Earth. Now, if I was going to name that kingdom something, there's a spectacular name that I could give it. I couldn't give a better name than this. What I'm going to call that kingdom is I'm going to call that kingdom the kingdom of heaven. What a great name. Because it is heaven's reign over planet Earth. You couldn't come up with a better name than that. I need to understand where this reign is coming on, but I need to understand where this reign is happening. Again, this is a kingdom that is established on planet Earth. I need to, I need to understand that. And if I don't understand that, one more time, I'm going to theologically cut my neck. Um, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand, how long is that? Forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof just might happen. It's short. It is going to happen. Um, that's the issue. You know, by the way, we're in a lot of political turmoil here, all over the world that happens. There's nothing new, by the way, that happened 200 years ago. It's going to happen um, in the future. There's nothing new about that. Um, liberals, conservatives throwing rocks at each other. Um, you know, nobody thinks they're doing the wrong thing. Everybody thinks that they're on the right side of the argument. You know that. So when they're, they're defending a point, they don't think that they're on the wrong side of the argument. They, they love their country. They believe that they're on the right side of the argument. They believe that they know how things should be governed. They believe that they know how financial things should happen. They believe that they know how education should be run. You have some ideas concerning that thing. They have some things, ideas concerning that thing. Our nation might have some ideas concerning how things should be governed. Another nation across the pond might have a different idea. Well, God has some ideas. 
He says, I'm going to establish a kingdom. I'm going to establish a form of, of government and culture, um, financial systems. But my system is perfect. Um, there's no flaws in my system. Because the God of heaven is going to be the one who's going to reign over this kingdom. He's the one who's going to establish this kingdom. That is the heartbeat of dispensational Bible study. If, 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 if we don't understand that and, and we, we go away with nothing other than that, then that's a really great thing to have is the understanding that God will establish a kingdom on the earth and God is doing something eternally in the heavens. Um, you, do, you and I do not play a part in this. So when I try to read into prophecy and say, well, this is what's happening and this is how I fit in, you don't fit in. We're reading about Israel's program. You know, God would have us do that. He blesses those that bless Israel. He wants us to learn about Israel's program. Uh, the same God that died on the cross for us is the same God that died on the cross for Israel. Um, he wants us to learn about these things. He wants us to learn about the scripture. Otherwise, these things um, wouldn't have been um, preserved in the first place. Now, um, I'll say real quickly, last night I, ha I had a couple of great conversations. I was talking to uh, Kinney. I was talking to David Reed. And, you know, a conference like this is so great. We we're always happy that people are online and can, and, you know, some people, are, it's difficult to get here. But that's what we're doing here, right, is we're studying the book. We're studying the Bible. We're getting together with other saints. That's an awesome thing. Um, learning from each other, comparing verses. If you have a question about something, we're studying this information all week. Um, I have questions about things. I ask people that know the information that might have more light than I do on that thing. I say, you know, I'm struggling with this. Um, that's what we do. Um, that's the whole purpose, and we're not just trying to plug this, but that's the whole purpose of Grace School of the Bible. Take this doctrine, you know, you, over on that, uh, on that logo there, there's a torch. That's what a torch is. Somebody's holding some light, and what do they do? They give it to the next person and say, here, now you, you take this, and you give it to the next person. Um, here's some light on some things. That's the pattern. That's, that's how the thing works is to take the information, um, pass it on to the next faithful man um, who can now go and, and teach someone else. That's the pattern. If you're in the school, I would encourage you to, to, stuck, um, to stick with the school. Um, it's a lot of work. It's not easy. Um, if you have a spouse that's in the school, encourage them um, to keep on keeping on. Um, there's, there's some men in this room and women that will tell you um, that the results are worth it. Um, and just again, what, a, what an awesome time. We're, um, we're thankful for that. Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you for um, your book, um, just that we might be able to read these things, um, learn about them, and be in awe. Um, and just that this entire week might be just fruitful, um, just a time of, of just incredible study, and just that we all might walk, walk away a week from now just knowing more than we do today. Um, and we magnify um, your son, the man Christ Jesus, and it's in his wonderful name that we pray. Amen.